So welcome to True Crime Storytime, engaging true crime readers at the library. Let me introduce this fabulous panel. I am Laverne Mann, the Cherry Hill Public Library Director. We also have Claire Thomas, Adult Services Librarian at Cherry Hill Public Library. Valerie Forrestal, Assistant Professor and Web Services Librarian at the College of Staten Island. And Amelia Rodriguez, who is a librarian too at the Mercer County Library System. So thank you to Reader's Advisory and the reference section for sponsoring this brand new uh, session and um, also NGLA Conference for accepting it. So we're bringing you this topic. We're gonna um, bring you some of the best of true crime podcasts, documentaries, books, and how a true crime mini con was run at a library. I'm going to share the slides now, and here they are. So, why true crime? Well, true crime is having a moment, but you could say that true crime has been having a moment for more than three centuries since the minister Cotton Mather published execution sermons for Puritan audiences. This is from Sarah Wyman, who's a journalist, a critic, and the author of Unspeakable Acts. If you're into the genre, the crime lady newsletter is something you might want to subscribe to. But true crime feels a little different now. It's more highbrow, it's participatory and investigative, and it's really more in the public interest. Um, the latest true crime moment, the new one, dates back to the fall of 2014, when the radio program This American Life presented its podcast spin-off Serial and Sarah Koenig's week-by-week -week account of the 1999 murder of Heyman Lee and the incarceration of Adnan Syed. The astonishing success of Serial really led to even stronger podcasts like In the Dark, Bear Brook, S-Town, and some we'll discuss today. It also led to new TV docu-series, especially due through streaming services, like The Jinx, The Keepers, Making a Murderer, they exploded. Um, it led to even more amateur sleuths that decided to take their pet cold cases and go to work. In 2018, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, Mac Michelle McNamara's book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, helped lead to the Golden State Killer arrest and the new field of forensic genealogy. And as Sarah said here, it has been breathtaking to watch this genre that I have loved my whole life grow and change. So I think she speaks for me too. These new podcasters and documentarians and writers really try to center the victims as humans and not just the trope of a dead white girl. It goes beyond the individual to collective stories. There are different subcultures and communities finally represented. They bring attention to topics like inequality and poverty and housing and addiction. Um, they are by and about women and people of color and they're unafraid to call out the problems that turn crime and murder into entertainment for the masses. Which leads me to say one thing that Sarah mentioned that consuming and creating true crime is an ethically thorny endeavor. It always was and it always must be. But some of these pieces are really going a far way to make the world a more just and empathetic place. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Val and Amelia, who are gonna discuss a small portion of the recent true crime podcasts. Okay, I'm gonna put my little stopwatch on. I have like 1.875 minutes to talk about each of these. <laughs> um, okay, so, these aren't, when I was picking the, the four that I wanted to talk about, I wasn't thinking like my most recent four, or I was thinking like four that really kind of encompassed some broader 
issues or that were like really good for getting started. I think to live and die in LA is like the perfect starter true crime podcast. I don't probably nobody in this um, talk is a like beginner, like just getting into it. But if you are to live in LA and die in LA is very satisfying because it actually gets solved, which, you know, spoiler alert, it gets solved. Um, and I know that's kind of an issue and it's, it, that one's pretty cut and dry in terms of it's a, an investigative journalist for Rolling Stone. Um, he actually gets contacted by the, um, the private investigator that's been hired by the family. So this is a nice one because he works with the investigator and with the family and you get this like real insider view. However, he is an investigative journalist, but this is, I wouldn't call this investigative journalism because he is like connected to it. Um, so anyone, anyway, also there's a season two coming out for anyone who did like to live and die in LA. There's a season two coming out that somehow involves the guitarist from Incubus. I don't know, have at it. I just, I wrote that down. Um, the second one, Missing and Murdered, there's two seasons. There's Who, Who Killed Alberta Williams and um, Finding Cleo. Miss, Finding Cleo. Finding Cleo. That one Finding, is really good too. Finding Cleo. And this one is like really very topical right now because they just um, found, I don't want to get into like the horrors of residential schools um, for indigenous people um, having their children taken. It's, I don't, it's awful and I don't want to, but these podcasts, the Missing and Murder podcasts, um, the host is Connie Walker of the CBC. And by the way, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Podcasts, are the best because they're so respectful and they're so like empathetic. And and she actually is, um, I believe she's a member of First, First Nations, of one of the First Nations, um, but she's Indigenous uh, in Canada. And she really gets into not just the the kind of murder aspect or the crime aspect, but talk so much about the residential schools, about the discrimination, about um, the highway of tears and, and people not looking for these women because they were indigenous. Um, this one, uh, if you're looking for resolution, this is not a great one for resolution, but it is so fascinating. Um, and like, she is such a good reporter, Connie Walker. She's so good. Um, okay, and then the next one was Happy Face. Um, Happy Face also has two seasons. Um, it's Happy Face, and then the second one is Happy Face Two Faced. And um, the cool thing about this one, well, not cool. It's not cool. Her dad, the host, her dad's a serial killer. Okay, that's not cool, but that makes it interesting. She has such an interesting perspective. And I will tell you, season one, Happy Face. The conversations that she has with her mother about her dad, the serial killer, and then the conversations that she has. So this podcast, Happy Face, is not about murder, really. It's about the daughter of a serial killer talking to people that were affected by her dad. And it is, I just, I don't want to give too much away, but there is a man called Don Finley. And there's conversations that happen between this woman and Don Finley, who was related to one of the murdered women that are just so touching and like amazing. Um, then my last one is Down the Hill, which by the way, if you do look at my podcast list, um, Down the Hill, I put what the Apple ratings are for each one. Down the Hill has the very lowest rating of all of them. And yet I chose it to be in my top four. Why? That doesn't make any sense. Um, I found, so Down the Hill is about two girls, Abby and Libby. They're both middle schoolers. And they went hiking one day um, in Delphi, Indiana, and they never came back. And it's just possibly one of the saddest stories I've ever heard. Um, but for me, and that's another one that don't get super prepared for resolution. Um, but it was a real gut check for me in terms of just talking to the people involved and talking about Abby and Libby. And I feel like sometimes if you really like true crime, you should listen to a gut check podcast where like they really give you a lot about the victims and the victim's families so that you can understand that when you're listening to these things, you're not distancing yourself from them completely, which you can't do every time, but every once in a while, I think. Anyway, okay. So that's why I recommended that one, even though it's rated low, it's a very slow moving one but it's so like in depth and it really like has a heart. It's a podcast with a heart. 
Um, okay, those are my four. Five minutes and 20 seconds. Okay, wait, let me set my timer so I'm good here. <laughs> okay, so like Val, I tried to pick ones that were kind of outside the scope of traditional, what people think of. So I, but I went with more recent ones. So my first one is Tulsa's Buried Truth. Uh, this is put out by ABC. It's hosted by Steve Osinsami, which was a big pool for me because I really like his voice. Um, it goes along with, um, a, I believe it was like a half hour or an hour news presentation that they did on the channel. It covers the, um, the background of the migration of freed slaves from um, where they were to Oklahoma and how they settled in the, the Tulsa area and built up um, their community. It does a recap of the night of the massacre, which is very, um, very touching um, and very hard to listen to. So be warned of that one. And then they start to dig into the cover up in the third episode. This is only three episodes. And that just blew my mind. Like, you, you know, it was covered up since nobody heard about it, but just the depth of the cover up was pretty intense. Um, so that was that one. Like I said, it's only three minutes or three minutes, three episodes, about 30 to 40 mi minutes per episode. My next one is Louder Than a Riot. This one's put out by NPR. It's hosted by Rodney Carmichael and Sydney Madden. They're both um, reporters through um, NPR Music. It's 12 episodes, about 40 minutes to an hour each. And the overall concept of the uh, podcast is the, dis the discussion of the rise of hip hop and mass incarceration. They go hand in hand and they get into the history of that. Uh, they get into um, this thing called the letter that get that got passed around um, music execs offices that basically said promote gangster rap over other kinds of rap and hip hop and then hand in hand a lot of these people had uh, hands in the um, privatized prison system. And then it talks about um, some rap and hip hop stars, some of them we know now, unfortunately, after they've passed like Nipsey Hussle. Um, some of them I didn't hear about until I listened to this podcast and now I'm all about their music. Um, but they talk about how uh, they use um, lyrics in court cases, which is technically not allowed in New Jersey anymore, which is great because a lot of times they're rapping about things that they don't know about or not, not that they don't know about, but that they didn't commit themselves. They didn't do those crimes. Um, they talk about um, just overcoming the prison system and using rap and hip hop as a way to turn your trauma into freedom. They talk about uh, the parole issues associated with it. That one's connected to the Nipsey Hussle case. And they also talk to Yo Gotti um, about how he sued Mississippi for human rights violations in prison conditions. I, I can go on more about this one, but limited time. So <laughs> go on to my next one. Now, this one was really interesting. So Killer Roll, this was put out by NBC News and Dateline. So it was Keith Morrison um, hosting. Again, love his voice. Uh, this was six episodes, 30 to 40 minutes. And it's about an actress who was in a low budget horror film. She's playing the killer. And she starts giving like advice about how things should be done. Like, you know, she would hold the gun this way. She would stand here kind of things. And then it comes out that she's actually been charged with killing her uncle. And that's the roller coaster part of the story is the whole story about how she killed him, why she killed him. It's family drama, money. It's really pulls you in. Am I doing on time here? Okay, good. So my last one, this is what I wanted to save time for because this one was just, this was a ride. So Imposters the Spy is put out by Parcast um, and it's hosted by Alex French. Uh, each episode's about 30 minutes and there's six episodes. So we start off by the first episode, Daisy tells you the podcast is about Wayne Simmons. He was a Fox News analyst. He said he had 27 year career with the CIA as a deep undercover officer and he would have all these amazing stories about drug busts and cartels and all the stuff that he does. And then it comes out that he's not telling the truth. So Alex starts to dig in because he, Wayne's claiming that the government turned his back on him, that turned their back on him. And the government's like, he's never worked for us. We have no record of him, nobody knows him. So Alex interviews um, Wayne himself who says he's got a black binder but he can't show all the information. Um, he interviews other agents who just don't believe Wayne's story. He digs into Wayne's job at Fox News and his connection with the, the analyst there and then his connection into political figures, which he brings out that um, Wayne Simmons was very pivotal in the um, 
Benghazi uh, release of information and the, the, how they twisted her, her, um, Hillary Clinton's words and used that to kind of bring her down in, in the, the election. And then they reveal what he actually got charged with um, to uh, the, these fraud charges against him, which was his tax fraud. So it was it was it was a really a roller coaster of a ride. But those are are mine. And like Val, I have a list not as detailed as Val's, but an, an ever growing list of shows. So those are awesome. I'm going right to download a couple myself. Um, so we're going to move on to the documentaries and docu-series that have really exploded. So here, uh, Claire and Val are both going to explain a few. Okay, hi. Um, so I know it's old, but I cannot get enough Elizabeth Holmes content. Please give me all the Elizabeth Holmes content until the heat death of the universe. Um, I listened to this, I listened to her podcast, um, which, what was the name of the podcast? The one about her? Bad Blood. That was a book. Bad Blood was the book. There was a podcast and then there it was- It was bad awesome. The book. podcast was good. That was Yeah, really and good. then The Inventor was the show, was the one on HBO. And I have to say, do all of them. Do all of them, mm -hmm. do all three. If you find any articles, read them. Um, she is fascinating. I, and crazy she crazy I just don't <laughs> I love I love weird brains because I have one and I don't know what's going on in there and I want to know all about it um so yeah all the content also HBO I know not everyone I just recently got HBO so I'm catching up on the HBO stuff but um they have a new ish uh QAnon um documentary which I or docu-series it's a series but I thought it was fascinating because actually goes into the people involved, which I had not, like, I was like, ah, oh, QAnon, it's this kind of conspiracy theory, like, whatever, whatever, but it actually goes into, like, where Q came from, 4chan, 8chan, 8kun, like, this whole drama behind the scenes um, that I had no idea was happening, like, all of these characters that um, are involved, so if you want to know more about QAnon and not, like, the like wacky fringe, but like where it's actually coming from, that one is great. Um, and then the next two, I think are both on, both th these were both Netflix ones. Um, abducted in plain sight, all the trigger warnings, all of them. Yeah. Every single content warning on planet earth for abducted in plain sight, it is, wow. Um, the reason that you would subject yourself to something like this, it's just that people are so fascinating. Like, I don't even know how to explain this documentary, um, but it involves child abuse by a neighbor and it's bad. But also so like the way that families work and how abuse, I mean, this happened also with like all the Larry Nasser documentaries, which and podcasts, which are also heartbreaking, but fascinating, where you're just like, the families, the people that kind of should have known, but they really didn't, and the heartbreak afterwards. Anyway, I'm going to be careful about that one, because I don't want to give details that whatever, but it was fascinating. And then finally, American Murder. This one was on Netflix, and this is really, was really unique to me, in that it, um, I can't remember there's a documentary or docu-series but it was all actual like video and an audio and Facebook posts from these people's lives and this one was a very satisfying ending because you do kind of get a little bit of closure and because of all of the fact that it was actual videos you can go back to the beginning and and you know who's lying when if you go back and it is just again with the psychology um you know it's a typical typical murder case of husband wife issue um but it has so much raw footage and more and more going forward these these true crime you're gonna have that you're gonna have these like actual snippets of people's lives that are documented visually and audio you know and socially and you go back and you say this person did this horrible thing and I'm looking them in the eye and I'm talking to them like like I'm not talking to them but um that one was fascinating to me too so 
I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm being like a little sketchy on details. I don't want to give, mm. I don't want to spoiler alert them. Um, so I'm trying to say what's cool about them without giving you the whole story. So sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm walking a very, a line there. <laughs> All right. Um, so my favorite uh, documentary from last year was The Ripper, which was a four part series on Netflix. Um, so I actually already knew about this case, but the best part about the show is that they don't really talk about the murderer at all, except as in terms of as a criminal. Um, the focus is really on the 13 murder victims and all the women who he attacked and who escaped. Um, it's also grounded in like the cultural and historical context of the 70s. Like there's a lot of um, issues. There's a lot of talk with, uh, about how the impact of feminism um, and the women's the women's second wave feminism had on the case. Also, the police at that time were awful, awful. Just really, you see all these mistakes that happened over the course of the um, investigation. Like they just decided people were prostitutes when they weren't prostitutes, so they could label them. They could label them as a prostitute killer. Um, so it does end with the arrest. I'm not because I, he did get arrested. It's no surprise. Um, the the interesting thing I found out about this one is that the the man who committed these crimes he actually just died in november from covid actually he was in um that notorious prison in england um he'd been there for years and years and years but that's i think that's why they were able to put out the the movie at that point um so he got what he deserved and then i'll be gone in the dark and Oliver mentioned it earlier this book has really become a modern classic um in true crime and the series that goes along with it it's fantastic because it's about the crime but more about um michelle mcnamara's process of researching it and writing her book and how it affected her health and her her like physical and mental health um it's about her family and her friends um and it's a really kind of sad story about how her life kind of went you know haywire because she became obsessed with with finding out who this killer was um and a, a, a read alike for this if, if you have patrons who liked i'll be gone in the dark the book or the show is a book called true crime addict um which is kind of a similar bent um a uh james renner the author he was researching the disappearance of a student at umass um and he got obsessed with this case and uncovered all these clues and he started having spiraling out of control just his personal life and his his mental health spiral out of control so those those are those are my two favorite documentaries from the past year or so and then there's this new ch streaming channel which i know is not free but a lot of people will will um end up getting it because it's very inexpensive it's about eight dollars a month for ad free uh service it's discovery plus so you get all what kind of i uh, jokingly called true crime light. It's that's not really light, but it's more of the like half hour hour shows that are on all the ID networks and um, discovery networks. Plus One of my, ghosts and gardening. And ghosts and house hunters. It's got everything. And 90 Day Fiance, for those of you who are interested in that show, which I'd never seen before. And then I was like, oh, you should watch 90 Day Fiance. And now I watch it sometimes. It's really terrible. Um, but one of my favorite shows that I've discovered through the streaming service is called Evil Lives Here, which is um, their one hour episode, 45 minute episodes. And they interview people who are either family members related to people who committed horrible crimes or um, victims or family members of victims. And they use photographs from the, the, the time that the crimes occurred or before to tell the story of the life of the people who, who were affected by the crimes themselves. So there's not a whole lot of focus on the on the act and the killer or the, you know, whatever, not just necessarily killer, the embezzler or mostly it's about violent crime though. So the trigger warning. Um, but it feels a lot more personal. People talk about their personal experiences, which I really, really like because I, I really don't care about like if the killer had a bad childhood. I don't care. <laughs> Actually, I think that's we have a couple minutes, so I just want to yeah. make a little segue here because we've had a lot. Claire and I have often discussions near daily because we work in the same building. But with Val and Amelia, we have talked about what we didn't want to highlight in different podcasts and docu series. So, panelists, if you will weigh in, I'm going to start with one that 
I did not like, which is the Night Stalker. Oh my God, terrible. I thought it was really gratuitous. It was certainly focused just from like hero law enforcement and not much about the victims. Um, So that was one, Netflix had been on a great run with docuseries, but that was a recent one. Um, Claire often calls it like a serial killer 101, like true crime 101 for people that really knew nothing about the cases, like maybe, but that's me. What about you guys? Like, what did you not enjoy recently? Oh, oh God, Cecil yeah. Hotel. I'm stealing Terrible, it. that was terrible. Why? I'm stealing <laughs> Cecil Hotel right away. Um, it's it's on, so bad. <laughs> it's on Netflix. It's about Elisa Lam, um, who was visiting uh, LA and was found... Um, she was found dead. I don't know if they ever declared it was definitely murder because they think it might be suicide. Yeah, in the water tower, most likely. But like, there were all these people trying to solve it online that were obsessed with it. But like, in they were creepy, bad at it. They were a, bad at and it in a creepy way. And then yeah. afterwards, when they o- reopened the hotel, all these people like went there and like toured it. And I'm sorry, murder tourism? No. Like, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's a vet. This is where it's very ethically thorny. And I totally agree with that one. However, so disappointing because it was the same documentarians that did Don't Fuck With Cats, which is really good. So I think, yeah. So what about you, Claire, Amelia, something you didn't like recently? Well, yeah, the recent for me was Cecil Hotel. Yeah, it felt yeah. like it felt like bad advertising because I know like the hotels going under like new <laughs> management and name change and like all renos and stuff like that. I actually got a better kind of feel for that based off someone I follow on TikTok who lives across the street. Wow. And like, so like he was just like filming and he was like, look, a light's going on. Like that was more entertaining to me than that, that docuseries. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I actually did not like the QAnon into the storm <laughs> documentary. Yeah, I how thought. How dare? How, how dare? dare? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even get through it. I thought it was boring. <laughs> so just to show you that there's so many like spectrum of true crime out there. And I think you may be surprised that um, up until this point, we have not said my favorite murder. I really yeah, do no. not like it. Um, no. I no. think it's too jokey for a crime and the details aren't correct. It's terrible. So, but if you I, are a murderino. I liked you know? it when I very, very first yeah. got into podcasts. I liked it. Um, but then after a while, it's like it got yeah. boring. And honestly, to me, I like the limited run series. Yes. Because I'd rather you give eight episodes to one thing and get really, really into it instead of yeah. trying to cover and something then, in one episode. Then you look for the books and the content. You're always, you're deep in it, but then it, you go on to the next thing. Yeah. All right. Well, this all started my life for me in true crime is because my mother was a true crime reader. The ones that had the images in the center were all over our home. So I'm just in six minutes, five minutes, going to do six books that are very recent to suggest. Starting with Unspeakable Acts. All these books have incredibly long titles, by the way. Unspeakable Acts, True Crime, True Tales of Crime, Murder, Deceit, and Obsession. This is edited by Sarah Weinman. Um, It has the introduction by Patrick Braddon Keefe um, and... It's an anthology of modern true crime writing. So it's really refreshing, exciting contemporary journalists. There are many stories, including the story of Dee Dee and Gypsy Blanchard, the murder and Munchausen cases that have been created into uh, Mommy Dead and Dearest and the act. Um, There's The Reckoning, which is like a a forensic journalism, um, outstanding tour de force and kind of local to Cherry Hill in Philly, uh, what bullets do to the body, a story of a 30 year trauma surgeon who did gunshot wounds at Temple University in um, Philly. So that's unspeakable acts. We keep the dead close, a murder at Harvard and half a century of silence. This is one of those stories that started as like, oh yeah, a professor murdered somebody on campus. It wasn't the story at all, but it propelled the author to investigate, um, Becky Cooper is the author, it, uh, the unsolved 1969 murder of Harvard student, um, Jane Britton, an anthropology student, and her obsession with this girl 
who dreamt of a rise among men. It's a tour de force of investigative reporting. There's academic politics and personal intrigue. Next, American serial killers, the epidemic years, 1950 to 2000. So, the post-war period in sort of macabre circles is called the golden age of the serial killer. We've certainly heard more about spree killings and shootings um, since this time, but the author is one of the foremost chroniclers of these modern serial killer stories. And this, these are many stories of men that are driven to kill in a succession that really was an epidemic. And uh, there's insight here on what drove them, but what's really important is Ronsky pieces together a theory of a unique American moment um, that led to these terrible crimes. The last three all have a New Jersey or New York tie-in, starting with this very long title, Dr. Dealer, a doctor high on greed, a biker gang high on opioids, and the woman who paid the ultimate price. George Anastasia is a well-known um, journalist regarding the mafia and the mob out of Philadelphia. This book he wrote with Ralph Cipriano. It was in 2012. April Kaufman was a local DJ at a South Jersey radio station. She was an advocate for military veterans' rights, and she was shot to death in her bedroom in Atlantic County, Northfield to be exact, or Linwood. Um, six years later, a pagan motorcycle gang member was on trial for this murder. But guess what? It was murder for hire by her husband, Dr. James Kaufman, who was her husband and also one of the area's most prolific drug traffickers through his um, doctor's office. It's really a story of greed, secrets, and arrogance. And the last two, this one really did not get enough attention, so I'm drawing attention to it. Tonight we bombed the U.S. Capitol. Um, William Rossino is the author. You may not have known, I did not, about M19 or May 19th, it was also called, the first and only female terrorist group in the U.S. They um, were founded and led by these six women on the cover. And they began with protesting, but between 1979 and 1985, they also did prison breakouts, murderous armed robberies. They did a bombing campaign in the US Capitol. They, many of them were born in New York. They were responsible for the murder of a New Jersey state trooper. And locally in 1984 at a Cherry Hill storage facility, hundreds of pounds of explosives, rifles, guns, ammunition were found um, that helped break some of the case, bring some of the people into uh, custody. So the author really helps you understand a little bit about homegrown terrorism and extremism, which still looms with us today. And finally, the last pirate of New York, a ghost ship, a killer, and the birth of a gangster nation, Rich Cohen. So was he the last pirate or the first gangster? It was the story of the bloodthirsty underworld legend who conquered Manhattan dock by dock. Albert Hicks ruthlessly operated in New York's Five Points, which was the most dangerous New York City neighborhood. In 1860, he was hired on an oyster sloop and he just was gonna plan to rob and flee, but then he murdered the crew and then the ghost ship floated up in New York Harbor, outside Coney Island, bloody ship, missing crew, and he was found. Um, it was a public execution on Bedloe's Island in New York. So Bedloe's Island is now what we know as Liberty Island. So where the Statue of Liberty stands is where the last New York public execution was held. But they thought, because of the extreme public interest at the time, they sold tickets, but they thought it might be a good idea to get people, it was free drinks on the ferry to the execution. You can imagine this did not go well and therefore it was the last public execution ever in New York, but a fascinating story um, of a time gone by. So now I'm going to move on to Claire, who's gonna talk about 
this might be programming you want to do the true crime yeah uh, so in um, October 2018, this is something Laverne and I did together um, because we are both big consumers of all things true crime. Um, we did it. We decided to do like a half day event, a true crime mini con. Um, we ran it from like one to four and uh, we had about 140 people show up at the max, the max um, for the first speaker, actually, who uh, we had we had two sets of speakers. Um, we had uh, James. Fitzgerald or Fitz as he's known. He is a retired FBI agent. He's a criminal profiler, a forensic linguist, and an author. And he's best known for his role in the Unibomb investigations. So um Laverne, what was the show that was um that was on Netflix, the 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 drama one that was about mind hunters? Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. yeah. But, yeah. So but, if you want to see HBO, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to learn a little bit about like kind of a fictionalized version of what happened. You can watch that that one. Um, he brought his copy of For Sale and Design. He has a Journey to the Center of the Mind, book three. So that he has books one, two, and three. They're really big and kind of dense, but and they were kind of expensive. I don't know how many people bought copies of them, but he did signings and took pictures with people. As you can see on the screen in front of you, there's Laverne with him. We had um, we had some photo ops with frames for selfies. Um, in between speakers in the beginning at the end, Laverne and I did some talks uh, a lot like what we did today with podcasts that we really liked and books and documentaries. It was a lot more um, comprehensive, though. We had stuff for beget like, you know, like even like forensic files and everything, things that everybody who was interested should probably watch if, if they really want to get into it. So we had we talked in a lot more detail about some of the uh, shows and, and books and um, podcasts. But then we also did some trivia. And we gave away prizes. I found in our donation room uh, those old school true crime paperbacks, mass market paperbacks. And we had like some CHPL swag and some other things that we gave away. And um, we also had two other speakers from Philadelphia, uh, Wendy Rutterman and Barbara Laker. They're reporters for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And they did a series called Tainted Justice. And it's about a rogue narcotics uh, division in the police, Philadelphia Police Department. Um, which won a Pulitzer Prize for journalism. And then they also co-authored Busted, A Tale of Corruption and Betrayal in the City of Brotherly Love, which is essentially about that story. But the sad thing when they did their talk, the sad thing was that they did all this work and it won a Pulitzer and then nothing happened. Like nothing changed with the cops, even though it was messed up. Like the cops were really, really shady. She told another story about going to some cop, angry cop's house eight months pregnant. I was like, you're brave, you're really brave. But it was a really fun event. Um, didn't take a lot of planning just because we had our two, we had our, our sets of speakers and Laverne and I both are so into true crime that really putting the other slides and talking about podcasts and books and stuff was, it wasn't a huge burden. Um, and it seemed like there was a pretty big audience for it. We did have a lot of people come out a lot. So the room was pretty full at different points um, and we wanted to do it again and then COVID hit. <laughs> so unfortunately we didn't get a chance to run it again. Laverne, did you want to add anything about it? Yeah, I just wanted to say that at this time, I had just come back. Um, you can't see because I was wearing my blazer, but I had my basically a detective shirt. I had just come back from the crime cons. So crime cons have really become like the latest comic con, like very popular. So this was our way of like scaling down and making it local. Um, but there's a new, there's another crime con like physically they move around and then there's virtual portions, but really if you can get a crime speaker, you know, we spread ours out on a full day, but just having one and people were so into the questions that we asked, like the multiple choice ones, like we were like running out of prizes and we had like candy. Um, so people wanted to participate. And then we asked uh, my, just to kind of throw in our local police department. So like a detective. He oh, yeah. Go. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. was he was he was very, very nervous. Um, he was but really he was very, very nice. And so he came and kind of spoke about like testifying and what it was like to be like a local detective. So I felt like that was a good way to bring in from the like national profiler to the like local and we love free and i think in yeah the, fitzgerald we basically did everything right fitzgerald did, did 
he or, did he wasn't going to take anything right and then i think we offered him a small a honorarium minimal, like a hundred dollars right. and then i wasn't sure because you booked um wendy and barbara so I wasn't yeah sure if they was were an just honorarium. local one actually lived in town but yeah they i really loved those women they were they were really brave uh philadelphia journalists and told funny stories so i attended the con and as a person oh. watching i have to say it was actually really good and i ended up getting their book after like I, I'm pretty sure on my phone I put it on hold and seriously what those two did like just by themselves walking the streets of Philly like to try to interview like drug dealers and stuff like it was just and if you have heard of Kensington and Philly Kensington area at that point it was like optioned and they were talking about even Julianne Margulies like playing the part nothing has happened to this point but it might pop up and here was our our detective and then his like police buddies even showed up too. But yes, uh, our Amelia, that's part of the reason we knew that she was true crime adjacent for us. So that's our official list. I believe I skipped over the beginning part that said all of these slides are available here in the session to download. Claire did a great job with the layout. I think they were very moody, which was good um as a oh and be. um val has a really great yes. resource list yes so i downloaded it and added it but as val said in the chat there's a link to it and she will never complete it because podcasts never end um well, there's, there's like 162 on it right now and i'm like maybe a third of the way through with filling in like the descriptions and stuff yeah and you're filling in descriptions and and apple podcast ratings you're crazy well i She's don't amazing. know how else if someone's looking at the list I, i'm trying to think of how they could make use yeah. of the list in terms of quality which, which, which yeah. one should i yeah play? that's true but honestly so many of those ratings i disagreed with anyway i was like what crime junkie has 4.9 and like this other one that i loved only has 4.8 or criminal <laughs> crime junkie yeah. is like 4.8 or 4.9 and criminal which is one of the best podcasts it is. hands yeah. down not even right. true crime it's a great podcast yeah so um, well produced that one has a lower rating i don't understand so okay well we, we'll go by val's ratings rating. you actually okay. inspired me i'm starting a true crime book list in the same way but you know it's harder with podcasts because you can always do good reads or something for books and you can do lists but thinking of this in your libraries like you can't collect the podcasts in a way, but you need to be aware of what people are listening to. So then you can buy content that relates to it. And a lot of these docu-series are released on DVD or they're on our streaming services. Like for example, Cherry Hill has Hoopla and we have Overdrive for audiobooks. So, um, you know, we try to kind of run the gamut of what's happening in true crime right now. Um, does anybody have anything they want to ask us in the chat or unmute yourself and ask? Oh, um, that's right. Right. Um, if I just not, say, we didn't mention a lot of New Jersey based ones, but if you do searches for like New Jersey serial killers and true crime, there are a ton out there. Too many scary. And then I also want to add, if you like criminal, also library related, um, the host Phoebe Judge, which again, I mentioned her voice. I'm very big with voices. Her voice is great. She also started last year at the beginning of the pandemic, started one called Phoebe Reads a Mystery. Yep. Yes. And yes. it's literally um, a chapter a day or half a chapter a day. And she's reading like old classic mystery stories. And it is like my go-to morning commute li listen. So her voice is great. I do see a question about have you ever done a true crime podcast docuseries club kind of like a book club we've talked about it we yeah. have talked about book related um more but we, we do have a must watch documentary series here at cherry hill so i think we've covered maybe not some of the ones we talked about today but Although, the, that's a really popular doing um, a podcast one would be really fun you could do like an episode of, like a week and then have people come in and talk about the episode and break it down that'd be that would actually be fun yeah i think yeah. and I, I think that we can also think about putting out like bookmarks or fly mm -hmm. half flyers that Kind of the way that we did with the slides today like here's you know content because we are collecting it ourselves mm -hmm. um so that's that's an interesting thing i have wanted i 
I know when I had done another session, there's a very specific of true crime graphic novels that just sort of hits everything I love in one place. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are a few of those and I've wanted to do that too, but, you know, but if anybody else has or will, please let us know. And if it's on Zoom, maybe we can attend. <laughs> we'll join, yeah. put my name down, I'm in. <laughs> right, right. 100%. Um, anything else? One of the things I liked a lot, I knew about, I can't wait to dive into the others and share with patrons. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm so glad those of you that took, you know, all the your time to watch us, we had a lot of fun putting it together and we really wanted to bring something modern and new um, to you. Anything else? What What are you currently listening to true crime podcast panel? I'll say I'm listening to the Piketon murders because my mother keeps talking mm -hmm. about the Roden and Wagner family in Ohio. And I didn't know what she was talking about because she watched the series and she gets it all wrong because she's 86. But now I'm listening to the podcast. That's <laughs> it's a season tough one. two. That's a tough one. Yeah, that's anything it's good. It's good, but it's tough. What I've else? been I've been listening to um, Relative Unknown, which I found out about. We uh, signed up and did uh, like six months ago. There was a um, uh, like an online live like true crime thing. And it's about this. It's from the perspective of a woman who grew up in witness protection. So like her yeah. father was a biker in Cincinnati. Oh, I saw and, that one. Yeah, it was it's it's good. I like it. What about you, Amelia? What are um, you currently listening to you want to mention? So um, season two of Park Predators just pre uh, released. And so Park Predators is about um, murders and different things that take place in the national parks across the Ooh. US. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, because there are a lot of unsolved crimes yeah. that yeah. occur in national so that parks. That was kind yeah. of like the, like the first season. She was like sort of like easing into it. And now I'm like, oh, second season. I can't wait to see, you know. Yeah. But yeah, apparently okay. national parks, beautiful and also kind of dangerous. <laughs> And there is a crime and friendship Facebook group that if you are interested, uh, you know, I got added to, I see our friend Danielle, who's also a big uh, true crime, um, you know, watcher. And so she got added recently. So if you are interested, let us know. Um, I'm not the admin at all. I just read about weird crime pieces in there. Um, <laughs> So, so if you have any questions about anything we talked about, we, I did in the chat, there are our emails, all of our email addresses are listed there. So feel free, anybody listening to get in touch. Yeah, and keep it, keep us, keep telling us about, you know, what's going on out there, what's coming up um, and keep watching Val's ratings and uh, <laughs> descriptions on her podcast. Those are copy, like as a librarian, I have yes. to fully admit those are copy pasted so that's okay i'm not copy, copy cataloging yeah it's just kind of yeah so can you get an academic paper out of this <laughs> well, I, have tenure now. <laughs> I have tenure now i don't have to make everything oh you don't have to write about it <laughs> into a paper anymore that was okay. so two years ago all right yeah i, I, can, I can just clearly have i'm a public librarian that doesn't know how thing those things work I can just have interests now and not have to make them into a project. I'm allowed to just like things again. We, that's what we do it. That's what we do at the public library. We have true crime interests. How do we make it a program? How do we make it a presentation? Um, you know, <laughs> I, like I always that. say I that's, about that that's, now. Yeah, that's one thing about public libraries. Like anything that you've learned or want to learn can come into play. So um, thank you for attending. I think they're going to cut us off in like one minute. Slides are there. Podcasts are there. You can email us. And thank you. Bye. <laughs>